into this mix dropped the doodler. And he was this guy who, uh, by all accounts of the day, uh, would go into gay bars, pick a mark, doodle a sketch of him on a napkin, uh, and then go up and show the sketch to the guy and say, hey, like my sketch, let's go fool around. Hi, everybody. It's Jeff. Wow, it's really nice to be back. This podcast kicks off season four for Story to SF, but we're calling it a special episode for a couple of reasons. You might remember Kevin Fagan from several lifetimes ago. He was our guest on season one, episode 13. Here, Kevin will talk about his latest project, the reporting and storytelling he's doing for his podcast, The Doodler, which launches today with parts one and two. Here's Kevin. You know, I've been a newspaper reporter for a long time, and, and a million years ago, I did a stint at the BBC Radio in, in London. So I had done, you know, the, the bit of the radio world, and then I decided, no, newspapers are for me. Well, all these years later, uh, podcasting, which is essentially radio in my mind, is, yep. is, has become a thing. So I've been doing podcasting for a few years. Uh, we had a, uh, we actually had a, a surge of podcasting many years ago, and then it kind of went away, and now it's back for several years. Um, this is different. This is a, uh, a true crime podcast series, eight parts, launches on March 7th, 16th, and uh, we'll have stories in the paper uh, on our, on our uh, Chronicle website to go with each podcast. Okay. So on the first day, the, fir- two, the first two episodes drop at once, and I'll have one story kind of unveiling things for people who just want to read it in the Chronicle or who want to read it and listen to the podcast because, you know, we do slightly different things in, in, in them. Uh, I have a different tone in the, in the stories uh, in the Chronicle and then use a couple of outtakey information bits here and there. Um, uh, but uh, the, the gist of it is that uh, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, a cold case cop from SFPD called me. I had known him through my longtime coverage of the Zodiac case. Was it a cold case cop cold calling you? Was that what happened? Yes, it was. Awesome. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just had to make sure. That's. Yep, yep. That's it. He cold called me and he asked me to find uh, an old reporter at the Chronicle who had written, co-written the last story that we had of any note on the doodler in the Chronicle, which was back in 1977. Wow. Uh, and so I went looking for the guy, a guy named Peter Kuehl, and turns out he was terribly ill and, and you know, non-communicative uh, and soon after died. Oh, no. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the cold case cop is named Dan Cunningham. He wanted to talk to Peter about what he remembered from the day, mm-hmm. because what he did was Cunningham had just dug into the Doodler case uh, from 1974 and 75, and he was trying to get new clues, see if he could solve this thing as a cold case that had been sitting around for 45 odd years. Yeah. And it's, it's a fascinating case in many ways. It, I believe it's probably the uh, worst unsolved killing spree case of gay people, LGBTQ people in America today, because mm-hmm. it dates back forever. And the doodler killed at least five people. Okay. And, uh, and he got away with it. Uh, and the, the, back then what happened was uh, there were these killings that happened, you know, over a period of a month, few months uh, it, until five stacked up. And <clears throat> there, they came at a period when a lot of gay people were being harassed, beaten, killed. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it was still, there were still sodomy laws on the books. Right. Uh, right. In fact, at the beginning of this, this whole uh, era, there were cross-dressing laws on the books. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was gay liberation at its its very beginning uh, mm-hmm. for for blossoming out. Right. Uh, I mean, gay rights had been a struggle for well forever. Um, was this when a, the Castro was still known as Eureka Valley, or was that that was name right, changed right around that? Yeah, yeah. It was changing. Yeah, the, the big area at the time was Polk Gulch. Polk Gulch, yes. And, and through the Tenderloin, had yep. had a lot of gay bars, and and gay bars were kind of the gathering place for people to, to come in and meet each other. You want to, to connect with other folks, uh, to talk about what's going on, talk about what your plans are. 
uh, you know, do uh, meet folks to, to, to go on dates with. Um, it was, it was a real, it was kind of a wonderful, uh, alternative reality of sorts. Community because, spaces. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and in particular, the drag queen scene, I just found fascinating. I, I mean, I've certainly known drag queens for a long time and digging into the history of, of what was going on then, uh, drag queens were super brave for doing what they were doing at a right. time when uh, at a time when it was illegal, especially right. to cross dress, or uh, you know, and you could get popped for sex crimes for on on you know uh, weird kind of uh, uh, side tracks uh, that people would people were essentially uh, being uh, oppressed. It was an oppressed community. Can you help our, our listeners just real quickly? When were when were the Compton riots? It was oh, late were, 60s. Late it was 60s. before Stonewall is all I really remember. But, yeah. But it's like the, uh, the point being, it wasn't just that there were laws against these things. It's that the cops were very um, aggressive in their enforcement of those laws. Right? They were. And it was interesting. And, and the, uh, the Tavern Guild was a, was a group that, that formed uh, in the late 60s, early 70s uh, to push back against police raids on gay bars um, because that, I mean, that was a pretty quick way if you wanted to go make a bunch of arrests and, and uh, bear down on homosexuality, which was illegal uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, go raid bars. But the Tavern Guild managed to push that back. It, it declined, but there was still, uh, uh, there was still know, harassment, uh, pressure, uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, various ways of, of phrasing that. The police thought it was just pressure. Uh, the gay uh, activists that I talked to from back in the day cer- certainly saw it as harassment. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't just it wasn't just police. It was roving bands of, of you know hoodlums would go vigilante. Around. Yeah, not even vigilantes, just oh. you know assholes. Yeah, right. Around you know throwing stuff at gay people, calling yeah. them names, beating them up. Right. Uh, it, it took some real chutzpah to walk down the street in in drag, yeah. or or just looking gay, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak, because mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, because guys, mostly men, of course, would uh, would be hassling you. And into this mix dropped the doodler, and he was this guy who, uh, by all accounts of the day, uh, would go into gay bars, pick a mark, doodle a sketch of him on a napkin. Uh, and then go up and show the sketch to the guy and say, hey, you like my sketch? Let's go fool around. Um, and off they'd go to any of a number of gay hookup spots where you could get away outside, you know, do your thing. And then the dealer would stab them to death. And this happened at least five times. There were, there were suspicions that the dealer had killed as many as 14. Okay. Um, that's still a, a somewhat open book. Uh, Is that still uh, within the two-year period or...? Yeah, it was it was an eighteen month thing of seventy four to seventy five. Okay, and um, uh, it 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 didn't get a lot of coverage in the mainstream press. Shock, right? Uh, and uh, the the gay press did cover it to the extent that they could. Um, and there was only a dawning realization that there was a serial killer at work as time went by. Uh, the first oh three killings kind of accumulated, and then. The police departments started to see a pattern. There, mm. They were rage killings, stabbed front and back, nice. found at the same kind of hookup spots outside. These, uh, uh, the, the talk was rampant through the gay bars that there's a guy doing sketches, he's taking people away, and then they disappear. Yeah. And so uh, the police department assigned uh, what was what was known as the Soul Brothers to the okay. case. The Earl Sanders and Rotea Gilford. The, Love it, it was uh, uh, Rotea was the first black homicide inspector of uh, the SFPD, and Earl Sanders went on to become the first black chief right. of SFPD. Okay, and these guys were they were snappy. I mean, they always had full suits on, fedoras, super polite. Uh, not not people to mess around with though, because they were okay. they were they were pretty tough. You know, both football players and you know in their youth, uh, and they had no trouble going into gay bars and talking to folks. They, right. they were really good with street people. 
uh, and really good with people who were, you know, outside what would be considered the mainstream of, of society, which at that time, of course, was LGBTQ folks. Uh, and they were, uh, they, they, uh, they connected well. And they, they worked this case hard because after that third, there were two more killings. Uh, and then some survivors uh, of Duke. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, so witnesses, the, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, a, there was an actor whose name is still not known, even to the oh, police. Wow. Uh, today, that is. Uh, and a, a, a guy called the Diplomat who worked at a consulate somewhere in San Francisco. Uh, and then a, a third guy whose name has never been out. I, all three of these folks, they never revealed their names. Uh, and the police honored that. Because back then at the time, what happened was they got attacked by the doodler. Uh, one of them was stabbed, the diplomat, and lived. Uh, the other one was a, a guy also living in Fox Plaza, which is a pretty upscale oh. apartment complex. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he screamed and other people screamed and essentially scared the doodler away before he could stab him. The actor was about to... to go to bed with the doodler and a knife fell out of his jacket mm. and the guy ran. Um, well, the cops had, had the names of these folks and wanted them to, to say, well, if we catch the guy, you know, will you go to court with us? Will you, will you, you know, drop a dime on him and, and identify him and help us with the case? And they said, oh, we can't do that. If we, if we come out of the closet Got uh, publicly, <laughs> You know, we're ruined. Right. Uh, career, family, I mean, you name it. It was just too risky at the time. And so uh, that, that was a major impediment in terms of trying to push this thing forward. Because the, the diplomat in, in particular was able to help generate a sketch and a description. And uh, the, the three, well, the, the two Fox Plaza victims in particular uh, just were able to give good description of what the attack was like and what the guy said while he was attacking them. Right. Was things like you gay guys are all like I've done this before. Um, you know, it was, it was it was scary and creepy and uh, and but useful for the investigators. So uh, they they uh, they compile a sketch, put it out there. And sure enough, uh, a shrink from uh, Oakland from Highland Hospital called him, uh, called the police and said. Uh, actually, a couple of people called first, and then and he called and said, "You know, I think I have your guy." Whoa! He, like catch, and he has told me in our therapy sessions that uh, he killed people on the beach. Uh, I think he's the doodler. So the uh, the the Soul Brothers get on this, and uh, Guilford launches over there and interviews the suspect. And suspect, of course, says, "No, it's not me. You know, I was struggling with my sexuality." but I'm cured now and I have a girlfriend. Um, and so, you know, the, the cops put this in the bank and, you know, in their files, that is. And, uh, uh, and they go back to these uh, survivors and say, will you help? And they say, coming out of the closet, no way. Uh, they have no confession. They have secondhand stuff from the shrink. It's really unclear what became of the interaction with the shrink after that um, and case essentially got shelved. Guilford went off to city hall to become eventually a deputy mayor. Sanders teamed up with Napoleon Hendricks, another legendary homicide detective, and he became a, a legendary team with him and then later on became chief. And you know, the, the department was unable to push this thing forward mm -hmm. uh, until Cunningham, two and a half years ago, opened up a box of, of the files and said, man, I think I can make something out of this. So it literally sat in the, in the, uh, the file drawer for 30, 40 plus years. 45, 45 or so years, yeah. And um, well, going back to what you're originally talking about, uh, your friend at the SFPD who called about it now, Cunningham? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, didn't he say that he's someone probably, you know, friend, he said, he's a cop. I'm a journalist. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Get along great. <laughs> yes. Sorry, your source, your source. Yeah. Not like we do um... Christmas together, <laughs> but he's a, he's a great cop. That's one okay. thing that's come clear to me in, in the middle of all this. I've, I've, uh, uh, he's been good enough to share and, you know, the investigation details that he can 
with me. And I've been hacking away at this thing for more than two years. Yeah. Uh, and intensively for the last, well, six, seven months uh, or more. Uh, you counted it since uh, August. I well, I. I know that uh, you said you weren't able to get hold of the Chronicle reporter. Were you able to get hold of what he was? With, what did he publish anything back in the seventies? Well, he, he did a story. Did a story okay. with another reporter who's just one passed away. Well, he did one, and there was one before it. Okay. Uh, but as far as each killing that, that came before that, they were like little little things in the in the paper. Yeah, uh, there wasn't a. Wasn't a whole lot of attention to the LGBTQ community at the time. Now we've changed. I mean, God, we have a diverse staff now. We have, uh, we have gay people, LGBTQ people on our staff. We have uh, uh, coverage of LGBTQ issues. Yeah. Hell, I've covered you know LGBTQ stuff since my days at the Tribune in the '80s. Right. Uh, you know, fortunately, times did change. The world changed, right? Yeah. And the police department has, you know, a lot of LGBTQ people in it now, and they're a hell of a lot more sensitive to, to those issues. Yeah. Uh, so it's looking back from the 2021 lens is, is interesting uh, to, 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 to view 1974, 75, because uh, it was a different time. Um, and, 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 and in terms of investigations too, and DNA wasn't even a term right. I remember back then right. and the uh no computers uh files were all by hand they had you know nearly triple the, the the amount of murders every year that we do now and they had a smaller population right uh, so it was uh, uh it was a tough one to crack and i think sanders and, and guilford really put their shoulders the wheel on it and and took it as far as they thought they could um the trouble is that a lot of the files over nearly half a century. Uh, the, uh, I think that some of the files went, got placed in other folders as other gay killings happened mm. and they didn't get put back in a doodler box of some kind. Yeah. Uh, Cause there's some notes that I would love to have that may or may not exist. Uh, and actually saying I'd love to have them is kind of uh, odd in itself cause I can't look at those files. Great. Uh, and Cunningham is, is, searching meticulously through other cases to see what else he can scare up and he's he shared some uh you know some important stuff with me that he's been able to share uh he can't share everything because it's a you know it's a murder case right i'm assuming cunningham's going to be in your doodler podcast yeah he is and he, uh, can you tell us it tease us any of the other folks you've been working with as you've been investigating and then obviously creating producing this podcast Oh, it's it. been fascinating. It's uh, <clears throat> like I said, it's a different format because as I'm writing, as I'm doing these podcasts with, you know, with a, with a script writer, um, uh, I'm also writing stories for the Chronicle to, call to go with them. Um, right. And uh, I think I mentioned that before. Uh, we, we have a, a deal that we signed uh, at the Chronicle with Sony Music uh, and which owns or has, you know, has a subsidiary of Neon Hum podcast company and then Ugly Duckling Films in London. Uh, and between us all, we're uh, working on the podcast. It's like a pretty big team. And they're, they're uh, I mean, they're, they've hired a musician to do the, the score for the thing. And it's, nice. it's kind of like a little mini audio movie. Um, nice. Uh, but uh, uh, you're, it, you're the host though, right? I'm the host got and it. I narrate everything. Got and it. what I did is I got them to, to hire uh, one of my best friends in the business ever, a guy named Mike Taylor, uh, who was an investigative journalist and an editor and a journalist of many hands at the Chronicle for a lot of years. And he retired in 2009, and he's a private investigator now. And he and I worked the Unabomber case together, Polly Class, 9-11. I can't even count them all. We, we you know, practically finished each other's sentences. <laughs> really good at finding people. He is your friend. Yes, he is. <laughs> he is my friend. Colleague and, and friend. Yeah, and, and one of the big challenges in this was um, you're asking who, who, we, who we interviewed is finding relatives of victims because ah. there wasn't a whole lot in there. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a kind of time for whatever reason where 
uh, when there was a string of murders like that. Today, we would go hunt down all the relatives that we could and sure. then try to do little profiles of each victim. Didn't happen back then. I was going to uh, ask, Was there, did the cops even, they did a sketch, obviously they had some uh, firsthand witness testimony, but did they have, did they, or did they make a profile? Because this, I feel like we're in that era where all that stuff was brand new. It was coming out of a lot of coming out of the yeah. FBI, right? Oh yeah. That's the, that's, that's the thing that was, this was before right. the, the commonly accepted concept of a serial killer. Right. It wasn't even a term then, okay. uh, not as we know it now. And so what I've, what I've done is, is I've talked to a lot of uh, uh, gay figures of the day, LGBT figures of the day. Uh, uh, that was before LGBTQ was even a, a term. Right. It wasn't a wasn't a thing. Right. Um, I talked to Tom Amiano, terrific voice from from the early and mid '70s. Yeah. Uh, he was a supervisor and an assemblyman and a school teacher back then. Yeah. Uh, Cleve Jones, who was yeah. uh, you know one of Harvey Milk's right hand men. Uh, Ann Cronenberg, who was Harvey's uh, campaign manager, Willie Brown, who got the first, who who got the sodomy law overturned in mm. California. Uh, uh, Ron Huberman, who was the first openly gay investigator for the district attorney, and and all of these folks that I talked to were alive and active and aware and and crucial to that time period of, of seventy four and seventy five. Okay, and had memories of, of uh, what was going on and what was going on with the doodler and with the, the, the scene in the, in the community yeah. and the fears and the hopes and, and uh, you know, what, what has happened since. I uh, talked to uh, Commander Teresa Ewens from uh, the SFPD, who's the highest ranking LGBTQ uh, officer in the, in the police department. Okay. Terrific uh, uh, look back and perspective about how things have changed since then. Right. Um, thank God. And um, it's, the, the, the goal of this, this, this thing is, is it's not just your typical murder mystery because we did go, Mike and I did find relatives, every one of those victims who had never been talked to before. Mm -hmm. uh, Cunningham had managed to reach one sister up in uh, uh, you know, the Northwest of one of the victims and then shortly after that she died. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we weren't able to talk to her, but we did talk to uh, other relatives. And okay. uh, that in, in, in filling out the, the 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 life story of these folks, uh, I'm I think we we brought them some some dignity. Uh, th there were there were several goals of this this whole series because I've written hundreds, if not thousands, of crime stories over my career. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them deep and long like this, and some of them short. And the thing about this this particular subject was it goes deeply into LGBTQ rights and oppression mm -hmm. and history and triumph and and uh, evolution. Uh, and it, it these killings came at a time when LGBTQ people were particularly vulnerable because of the atmosphere at the time. And then it goes into the um, uh, the, the, the efforts and the, you know, some of the failings and, and then some of the, the admirable efforts of the police in this. I mean, Sanders and Guilford were uh, an amazing pair of investigators who really put in. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, we've got Dan Cunningham, who, you know, back in the old days, uh, 60s, early 70s, SFPD had a reputation among some people as an Irish old boys club. Is right. how Sanders put it in, in his book on the zebra killings. Um, Cunningham's dad is from Ireland. Right. <laughs> He's an Irish cop. And he is, he is going all out to try to, to solve this thing. And he has enormous sensitivity for the, the community. Um, and awesome. uh, he and I uh, uh, went together to the murder sites of each of these victims. And wow. stood there and looked at them and assessed them. Stood on the beach where, uh, you know, where three of them, Ocean Beach, where three of them died. Went to a Golden Gate Park at Spreckles Lake where another uh, man died. And then up on Land's End where the fifth and final victim uh, wow. that's been confirmed died. And 
tried to figure out, all right, why would you die here? Why would you come here? Why would you leave a body here? What made this an ideal uh, spot to do this kind of terrible thing? Um, and it was, it was interesting for me. I mean, the, the, there's, there's a line between journalists and police. You know, right. uh, we're not their handmaidens. And they're certainly not giving us you know, everything they have because they have to preserve their evidence for use in, a, in an interrogation room or in a trial. And I, right. and I respect that. I, of, of course I get that. Um, and you know, they get how we're, you know, we're, we've got our thing to do too. But in going to these scenes together, uh, it was uh, it was useful because I could ask I could ask him the questions I needed to ask pertinent to that case, and he could ask me the questions he you know wanted to clarify with me as a journalist. Um, you know, it's not like we're working hand in hand, but it's a I think at one point we say parallel investigations. I think yeah. that might be one way to put it. Um, well, it's interesting. One thing I noticed about those locations that you just mentioned, they're all very public and they're not just public, they're places a lot of us go a lot. Yeah. Right. It's so it's interesting that he that he chose that versus, you know, taking them somewhere private or secluded or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was interesting. They, they made sense in the end because uh, uh what the, you know, by all accounts, from what we've been able to put together, what the doodler did would he, he'd pick up his, his mark at, the, at a club, uh, and then he'd, for the, for the beach, you go down to the beach, this is going to be really late at night, midnight or, or later, right. uh, when there's no one on the beach. There's the, the pounding surf is, is a sound buffer. Yeah. The dunes are another sound buffer. It's dark as can be. There's bushes. Uh, you can do your thing on the beach. It was, yeah. it was a pretty common hookup spot back I think right it had it had everything to do with how he lured them it's up until up until the violence and the murders happened they were fairly common hookup yeah 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 and there's you know hookup spots there are hookup spots today and a lot of these are the same kind of places Spreckles Lake it was nice some nice bushes away from out of view uh Land's End perfect kind of hookup spot you're down a hill uh there's you know one can see you you got a lot of bushes right there to to, to hide in with some nice open spaces the under the bushes to you know do whatever you're going to do um they they all made sense and they were along the uh along the shoreline the beach kind of taking a little hitch up to the to spreckles lake which is you know really within walking distance right um and then back and then up up the coast just a little bit to Lands End. I mean, you can stand at the end of the, at the edge of Lands End where uh, the last killing happened, just to, just near there, uh, and you know, see right down to Cliff House. Right. Uh, it it, it kind of made sense, and then he moved inside to the uh, taking the uh, going home with one of the victims at Fox Plaza. Um, you know, there's any of a number of reasons why that happened, maybe. Well, Kevin, I am so excited to uh, hear and experience this podcast. Do you want to tell our listeners, of course, they'll be listening to this first. No offense. Um, <laughs> do you want to tell them where, where and how to find it? Well, there's a website, doodlerpod.com for okay. the podcast. Uh, you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, uh, there's, 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 there's several of them. It's the usual, usual places you go, go to the sfchronicle.com and boom, it'll be there with our story, uh, which will lead to the, the podcast itself. Um, and it's, uh, 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 it's, 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 I think it's a very interesting thing. It's, uh, you know, we're trying to get to the bottom of the murder mystery and I'm still reporting the thing right now. Right. Uh, and I'll be reporting it as the podcast runs and probably after as well. And it would be nice to bring some resolution to the case. It's not guaranteed. Right. Uh, and actually things unfold as you listen. It's a serial. It runs weekly. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to have a seven week journey while you kind of unravel this thing with me as we go and, and with Mike and you, you learn who these victims were. I, it was just, it was really touching. Uh, there, there's uh, you know, all five of them just break your hearts when you see what happened. 
right. to them and who they were and the, the journeys that led them to, to being in San Francisco and then being victims of the, of the doodler. There's, there's only one person who, one victim who has relatives still in the Bay Area and that's Jay Stevens, who was a drag queen of, of great note back then, rising star, great young person in his 20s. Uh, and I spent quite a bit of time with his sister remembering she was she became part of his act uh, uh, in Polk Gulch and then he was at Finocchio's uh, you know heading even higher uh, in the in the performance world when he was killed a guy named uh, Fred Capen who Capen uh, who was a war hero uh, a guy named Klaus Christman who came from Germany uh, looking for a better life uh, a guy named Gerald Cavanaugh, who, who came down from uh, Canada uh, looking for a better life. And then a guy named Harold Goldberg, who was the, uh, uh, the last victim uh, confirmed and who was a merchant seaman. And uh, it was the, the, the sad, lonely way these people died. Just uh, the murder is never, it's, there's nothing good about murder. Right. And uh, everyone, everyone of who dies has their own special story and the special terrible aspects to it. This one, these ones are just it's awful ways to die. That was journalist Kevin Fagan. Check back Thursday for another special episode of Storied San Francisco, where you'll hear an excerpt from Kevin's podcast, The Doodler. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. The show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have nearly 150 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can subscribe, rate, and review our show so that we can reach even more folks. And if you'd like to drop us an old-fashioned email, we'd love it. The address is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.